good evening. You're very welcome to this week's edition of Centre Ground. And tonight, the spotlight is on Tussle, the Child and Family Agency. But before we begin, I'd like to pay a tribute to Stephen Kerr from the Irish Inquiry, who is making this live stream possible. In the weeks ahead, Stephen um, is bringing on more presenters for some new programmes. And um, he's asked me to put a call out for uh, people who have really good skills for uh, editing skills, videography skills, um, that you can volunteer. If you go to the Irish Inquiry website and to the drop down tab, help us, you can enter your details there. Um, the Irish Inquiry is not sponsored and it doesn't um, carry out advertising. So we are relying on volunteers to help us to get programmes out. As I said tonight, the spotlight is on Tusla, and um, we're going to begin in a moment with a pre-recorded um, interview that I did with a mother earlier whose um, children were taken following an intervention by Tusla. And then I will be speaking uh, to William Cummings. Um, you will remember that William uh, was a guest when we did the programme two weeks ago on homelessness. Uh, William is a volunteer with Dublin uh, Inner City Housing Homeless, and he is the founder of BABS, Be Aware, Be Safe, the advocacy group for homeless people who are experiencing mental health difficulties. And uh, my other guest is uh, Dr Finbar Markey, who is um, an independent uh, campaigner. And as always, uh, Marion McGowan will anchor our panel discussion in the second half of the programme. So um, I'll begin now um, by saying that earlier I interviewed Mary. Mary is the founder and director of quite a large company and her troubles with Tusla began when her estranged husband made a malicious complaint to Tusla about her. She begins the interview by telling me what happened when he did this. And well, um, how I lost my children was I was living alone with my children. Um, I was a single parent, I got divorced and life was pretty good. Um, unfortunately for me, um, the children's father was extremely abusive. Um, and up until Tuesday got involved in our lives, we had the protection uh, of the courts. Um, I had a number of um, different court orders in place and kept everything nice and quiet. Um, unfortunately, um, he had been making false allegations to social services and eventually brought the false allegations uh, to the Garthi, which were then passed to Tuesla to investigate. Um, on a particular day, uh, two young social workers arrived at my house um, and decided um, that, in fact, after about 30 minutes, that I actually was um, an abusive parent. Uh, as a director uh, of a, a, a quite a large company, um, and with staff and, you know, really, I wasn't a spring chicken, you know, to be told that I, I needed support as, as a single parent um, was just completely a surprise to me and, and very shocking. Uh, but to cut a long story short, um, the team leader for these two young social workers uh, child assigned my three children onto the child protection notification system without uh, holding a case conference. So that was the, the procedure at the time. Um, a couple of weeks later, um, I sat at a meeting with their uh, different manager and I, I just proved all the allegations um, and uh, had another meeting then a couple of months later with another senior manager. Um, and disproved all of the allegations and, and they apologised uh, for the mistakes that had been made and said that they would sort it out. Um, unfortunately, then about two months later, um, the same person, the team leader who had signed the child protection notifications, uh, took to making phone calls to me um, and, and really saying, you know, that she felt I was abusive, therefore I was, and she called two additional case conferences under false pretenses. Um, at the second of these meetings, um, there was a whole range of different civil servants, guardy, the schools, um, councillors, et cetera, et cetera, who were actually called 
to this meeting and I, I believe that the, the the purpose of this meeting um, was to really destroy my character and credibility within my community and it, to even my relatives and to gain support for the removal of my children. And also I think the purpose of these meetings was to justify the, the, the reason that my children were on the child protection notification because at the time when they were signed on to it at a very early stage um, this person had never met me or my children and wouldn't have had enough information uh, to make this decision. A further six months later uh, a review case conference um, was held and the the team leader actually produced a document that supported the permanent removal of my children. Um, and at, at this point then, you know, once Le Tuzla had officially labelled me an unfit parent in the courts, um, I could get no support from any solicitor uh, to take any further action um, in order to get them back. So it was an absolutely desperate time and very, very devastating time for me um, at that time. Mary went on to tell me what it was like for her and her children after the trusted social workers had worked with her coercive former partner to take the children. Living with, without the children, um, well, first of all, they had been taken from me without my consent. I had really, really vocalised that I was unhappy with this, um, but my feelings really, really weren't taken into account. Um, it was absolutely devastating for me. Um, I couldn't bear to go down to the, lo the local town and, and see at the, the time that children were coming out from school. That absolutely devastated me. Um, I couldn't bear to look at other parents doing normal things. Um, the children were phoning me on a regular basis. Um, they were saying, look, where are you, mum? Where have you been? It's been two weeks. We haven't seen you. And it turned into years. And in actual fact, um, the children at the times weren't attending school. They weren't getting regular meals. Um, the youngest child I was aware was being left alone at the weekend. And um, what was really, really difficult um, for me during this time was, was that I actually knew that um, I'd disproven all the allegations very early on before the children had been removed. And the place where they put the children, which was with, with my ex-husband, um, he had a, a history of documented uh, violence and abuse. Um, it was very, very aggressive. Um, there were all of these documents to prove it, um, but um, in fact, the social workers ignored all of this and said it wasn't relevant to them. Um, as time went by, I was having to sneak food parcels to the children. I was having to bring them to the dentist in secret. I was having to bring them to the doctor in secret. Um, as a result of the, of the court um, action, um, I was now paying maintenance uh, for the children's upbringing uh, to this other person who was then gambling the money. Um, at times when I went to visit the children with the food parcels or the bring to the dentist, I would actually get phone calls from the guardie uh, to warn me not to go near the house and um, that I was abusive and I wasn't really to have any contact with the children outside the very limited contact that had been granted through the courts. Um, the social workers were, were visiting the children as well and really undermining me as a parent to, to the children. Um, during the time that I was without them, um, I engaged with the um, director of advocacy to try and resolve it um, and gave them absolute proof that what had been put into the reports um, was untrue and the, the the mishandling by the social workers of the case and really pointed out all of the things that he had done wrong. He eventually did, did a report that really, really supported um, the social workers um, really in, in contradiction of, of all of the, the things that they hadn't done right and he just completely ignored that and absolutely supported um, the social workers. He apologised afterwards and said, look, um, you know, you should have just looked it up and it would have been all over very soon, um, which I found very, very difficult uh, to take. It was a long, difficult battle for Mary over many years to get her children back. She describes now how it happened. I did a number of things to try and get the children back. Um, well, first of all, I put together all of the freedom of information documents and correspondence that I received. Um, I presented a very, very large file to Tusla to show 
um, that the allegations against me from the very outset were untrue and to prove that the social workers had breached their own procedures. So I contacted um, a very senior service director, a senior management, um, and they just really, really weren't interested in talking to me. They just didn't care. Um, I was told, look, forget it. This is all done. Um, we're not interested. Um, I contacted Francis Fitzgerald. Um, I did contact the Guardi at times and other TDs. They just really weren't interested. I received letters back passing the book from one person to another. It finally took one of the children uh, to complain about their neglect to the courts. And at this point, the court intervened and ordered Tusla to investigate uh, the claims by the, by the, uh, the children, but not by the original social workers. And eventually um, a different team completely said, look, the, you know, that the children have been placed in an unsuitable home. It's not catering for their needs. and. Um, you need to take back possession of your children. So the children um, were given back to me um, because of this intervention. Um, very shortly after, a year afterwards, um, I put in a huge, big, long complaint into TUSLA documenting um, all of the mishandling by the social workers and um, even proving, look, things were done wrong. Um, some of the information that was created or the information that was put into the files by the social workers wasn't correct. Um, there were a lot of uh, difficulties and faults here within the paperwork and, and essentially a lot of the information within the documents that they produced was provably untrue. Um, eventually an, an independent review was done uh, and in, in fact, the review was absolutely scathing in its criticism of the social workers' in, involvement. Uh, but sure, it was too late then. Um, so the damage was done at that point um, by the social workers. Um, but I do, I do have the independent review report now. Um, and I think anybody looking at this report who is facing an investigation by Tusla would say, look, I'm just not going to go here or I'm going to do my utmost to actually prevent um, them getting involved. Because certainly um, the in individuals that I met, um, I, I would say that they're extremely untrustworthy. Mary has her children home, but it hasn't been plain sailing. The damaging effects of separation are long lasting. She describes now how they are starting to pick up the pieces. Since I got the children back, it's been really hard uh, for all of us. Um, being out of my care destroyed my relationship with the children. Um, up until the time that Tuesla got involved, I was able to protect them from their father's really, really terrible behaviour. Um, I couldn't protect them from the awesome power of social work team. Um, and who clearly didn't have the best interest of my children as their core focus. Um, so from that point of view, they look at me and say, why couldn't you protect us um, from this? You know, we, we, we were so innocent. I mean, this is a, year, a couple of years later. Um, I had to put the children uh, through counselling. Um, they, they, it's destroyed their education. It's destroyed their mental health and their physical health. So it's been really an uphill struggle uh, to try and put them back into courses, put them back into education. And they've missed on, out on so much um, because of this Tuesday intervention. Um, I, I sort of believe that my family was a soft target for Tuesday, uh, really to exploit the children in order to increase their intake of children. Um, and I feel really, really angry. And my children also feel angry about it. And I absolutely believe that from the very, very beginning, looking at the documents, um, like I did do audio recordings of that really to protect us from the behaviour of the social workers. But going through any of that stuff, uh, nobody could possibly believe that the social workers that I met had any interest in what was best for my children. Um, but, but certainly um, trying to damage the, the all or trying to repair all the damage that's been done is really really hard and it's an ongoing process every single day and um, in, in every aspect anybody with a heart cannot but be very disturbed by mary's story and sadly she's not alone and um, 
over the years, I've been contacted by many, many mothers in very similar circumstances. And I brought a number of them together last year in June 2019 um, to a meeting in Athlone. And there they established an advocacy group for mothers experiencing difficulties with TUSLA, ABC, the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice. Earlier this year, singer-songwriter uh, John Spillane wrote a very beautiful ballad. He calls it ABC, Justice for Birth Mothers. And we'll have a listen now. In the land where I was born, there are no women seeking justice. Justice for birth mother, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Give the mothers back their children, give the children back to the mother. Justice for birth mother. Oh Lord, hear my prayer Look into your mother's face No one else can take her place Justice for birth mothers Oh Lord, hear my prayer Motherhood is hard Support the mother, the mother and the child together. Do not tear this love asunder. Support, respect the mother. Justice for birth, mother. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. the sins of the father be visited on these children justice for birth mother oh lord hear my prayer my children have been taken by the force of law and order in Ireland, Holy Ireland, justice for birth mothers, oh Lord, hear my prayer. One song you don't want to hear is the cry of the mother and her child taken from her. Justice for birth mother, oh Lord, hear my prayer. In the land where I was born, there are now women seeking justice. Justice for birth mother, oh Lord, hear my ABC, Justice for Birth Mothers, composed and sung there by singer-songwriter John Spillane. And if you want to find out more details about ABC, the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice, you will find them on Facebook. My first guest this evening is William Cummings, who is a volunteer with uh, Dublin Inner City Housing Homeless. He's also the founder member of Fab's Be Aware, Be Safe, which is an advocacy group to support mothers uh, who are homeless that are struggling with their mental health. You're very welcome, uh, William. 
Thank you, Anna. Thanks for having me on um, tonight. Uh, it's always good to be on. <laughs> yeah. Um, William, you might begin uh, by telling me a little bit about the advocacy work that you do uh, for mothers and on behalf of mothers who are homeless, whose children have been taken into care. Yeah, so we're we're in here with Inner City Help and Homes, as you know, um, and we have our own service called the Babs Empowerment Service. So what we, first and foremost, we look to build up a rapport with um, with the mothers. And we, we try to build up rapport and trust um, uh, because, we you know, as we know, the, the system invariably has failed them many times. So uh, we we're fully aware that they're a little bit anxious when they come towards when they come into us um, that it's not just lip service that they get that we're actually going to do something um, for them or at least um, a system going forward. We once we once we've done that um, once we've built up a bit of rapport and we and we feel we have a bit of trust with the client then we look at breaking down the barriers that are put in front of them. Um, and a lot of the time, these these, these barriers um, seem to be, uh, you know, put there and, and very, very hard to get around. And, and we try to break them down and go at them one at a time and try and un understand fully what's happening for the mother and um, what where where are they in the, in the process of, um, you know, if they have a reunification plan, all of those things. And then we look to be like the central point for contact because they might be they might be talking to five or six different um, agencies. And that can cause a lot of confusion and the agencies are kind of speaking to each other and sometimes the mother is out of the loop. So what we look to do is we look to be the central point for all those contacts. And we would write out to them, we have consent, we have verified consent, and we would write to all the various different agencies and ask them to come back to us with, um, you know, an update of where the mother is, what are they looking for the, the, the mother to achieve, and how do we go forward with this. And this, this in turn then helps the mothers achieving uh, their, their goals going forward. One of the things that we have been told by mothers is that if they are um, seen as a single person and moving around homelessness, then um, their letters and you know their their court appointments, uh, various different things, or whether they might um, you know they, they might have a doctor's appointment that they've missed, or they, they they might have an appointment with their social worker that they've missed, or their phone might get stolen, and therefore everything, all the information is gone. So what we do is we look to to build you know, to have that information readily available here for them so that we're able to contact, you know, if something happens or if they move, um, if they're moved from one hostel to another for various different reasons, um, they're not relying on, on a letter to be sent. It, it can be sent to us and we can um, we can then advocate for the mother. We can keep the mother updated. Um, we also look then at uh, what are they recognised um, as in, in in homelessness? You know, are they are they are they recognised as a mother? Um, is their homelessness exit plan in place? And are they being recognised as a mother or already seen as a single person? And then we would advocate for them on, on that. And then we look at the reunification plans and are they achievable in the current um, state of, of of where they are? And do we need then to advocate for them to maybe um, upgrade their accommodation if, if that's if that's needed? Um, some some others choose to choose the HAP system uh, just so that they can say that they have a stable base. Um, and, and we talk them through that. We we would go through um, a kind of a, a a beginning where we kind of get a, a level ground of where they are, and then we we look at moving forward at their pace. Um, and we try and keep all the agencies uh, together in, involved with that. Right. Now, uh, one of the um, things that happens is that uh, many women can be years in emergency accommodation or homeless. And in that time, uh, sometimes they get pregnant. Have you come up against that? We, we, we have come up against that. And, you know, we um, sometimes... Uh, 
the, the mothers tell us or the, or, the, or the people that do become pregnant tell us that there's that, that there's shame in it you know and, and and they shouldn't and they feel embarrassed to, to to go to the hospital and tell them that they've that they've gotten pregnant in homelessness but like at the moment we know of of young girls that, that are going into homelessness and being in homelessness for up to seven eight years and they, they've got the, they've got the right to move forward um, you know they, they can't put their life on hold for for that long um, they're also um, they're in, they, they might get into a relationship. It might be a relationship for protection or just to to have comfort um, to, to to get them through. They might be disconnected from their families, and um, this is the only bit of comfort comfort that they have, the only bit of kind of um, social circle that they have. Because if you're in homelessness for that long, your social circle starts to diminish. Um, and uh, some of those relationships, while they, while they're there for, you know, while, while they're there for whatever reasons that the, the two people are together, they, they, they can become volatile. So the, the, the person may become pregnant um, out of, you know, for, for whatever reason. Um, and then they, they feel, some of the mothers have told us that they, they feel embarrassed then because they're going and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm of no fixed abode. But if you're going to subject um, people to this length of homelessness where there's no real way for them to, to exit out of it, then, you know, people are going to, they, they have to move on. You you can't ask somebody to put their life on hold for that long without any kind of exit plan in place. It's just not, um, it's just not right. And, and you know, um, there, there is a lot of there is a lot of women out there that have uh, that, that that have that parental you know that that have, want to be a parent want to be a mother and they, they have no option but but to do it in this setting it's 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 really not ideal but they they feel that they want and need to do it and is it happening um william that uh Tussle, the child and family agency is saying that the best interest of the child is to go into foster care until such time as the mother is accommodated. Yes, that is what that, that is what we have been told. There's, there's also um, we have it on, on um, from various different mothers as well, telling us that um, they, they've heard an undercurrent or a rumor from various different councils that if they were pregnant, it might help them. With, um, with with their position on on the housing list. Now the thing the thing about that is is that if then um, two of the mother and baby they see get involved and and the child is taken away, then the, then the mother is is seen as a, as a single person again. So it, it you know I, I think there has to be a lot of joined up thinking here um, and, a, and a and a re education. Um, around this this issue because if that you know it, we we have a lot of people coming to us and telling us you know that oh well well they heard and it was suggested that if you had a child or got got pregnant you you may move up the up the ladder and I, I think that's um I I think that has been around for a long time but I think that needs to I think that needs to change it needs to be a re-education on that because um if 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 the child is taken into care into foster care until a, until a time, well then the then the mother is seen as a single as as a single person. Okay, well along with that then, um, what else would you like to see happen in order to help mothers, homeless mothers whose children are in the care system? So, I think that more services are needed. And there needs to be, a, a, you know, p- people are probably going to get fed up with me saying this, but I, I do believe that there needs to be a better understanding of the individual needs of each person that goes into homelessness. The the individual needs of, of the person going into homelessness needs to be looked at. There can't be a blanket, um, a, a blanket resolution to everything because that isn't working. We, we need to have the individual needs looked at. And I, you know, and I, I spoke to a mother uh, um, the other day, and she told me that she was told um, by a social worker that um, she did not have the correct parental skills because she came through the care system. And my argument back on that is that it, if you're saying it's in the best interest of the child to go, in, to go into foster care and stuff like that, then why aren't we ensuring? That if somebody does that and it's a necessary need for them to go into the care system, why do they not 
have the, the correct parental skills. Why was it not taught? If we're saying this is the best place for this child to be, why aren't we teaching those? Why aren't why isn't why isn't the government or the or, or like why aren't the services ensuring that that child when they come out of that have parental skills? And I'm talking about both sides of the coin here, men and women. They need to be able to have the parental skills when they come out. They need to have the proper life skills. It is not fair to say to somebody that that is that that is um, that you don't have the skills because you are in care, because then their child is taken into care. So then we are there, and um, you're in the interview. I heard um, the, the the lady saying that that they're they're teaming people up, they're they're adding children in um, to the to the service. Well, that's what it looks like. If you're telling somebody you're in care and you don't have to, and that's the reason why, well, then it looks like that they are fueling the industry that 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 is foster care and is is the child and is the. So I would look for more accountability for when things go wrong. Even more accountability is sort of reason why we can't support that mother and the child. Why can't we? Why can't we look at that? Why can Why can't we look at that? Make sure that the child is in a safe environment, but make sure the mother is there as well, and make sure that we are looking to put the two of them together, and and help the mother, um, you know, help the mother raise the child, because if you take the child away, you're you're denying the you're denying the mother, the 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 right to parent that child. So uh, you know we'd look for. We'd love for constancy and transparency um, and like there is some good work done by TUSA, but um, when things go wrong, there just seems to be no accountability. And I, I don't think as a society we should sit back and allow that to happen. OK, well, on that note, we'll leave it for the moment, William. Um, I think you have made an excellent point there at the end that we need accountability from TUSLA. And there has to be some kind of supports put in place to enable mothers and children to stay together and not to be separated. So thank you so much, William, for that. Thank and you. We'll be back. We'll be back to you later for the panel discussion. Uh, my next guest is Dr. Finbar Marke. He is an independent community activist and uh, he's going to chat to me um, about uh, systems failures. You're very welcome to Centre Ground, um, Finbar. Hi, uh, Yana, and thanks for the invitation. Maybe you might begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Yeah, I'll give you a bio just in the context of the conversation that we're having at the moment. Um, so I have an honours degree in applied social care and social sciences. So um, in that context, I worked in residential care for, with adolescents in residential care for about 12 years and seen a lot of stuff in there. Uh, worked with families that were working with Tusla and quite often we would be the intermediaries in terms of between Tusla and the families. Learned a lot from it. Some of the experiences, um, let's say, turned me off significantly especially in terms of the difficulty in advocating uh, within a, a privately funded, uh, or sorry, a private uh, care organisation, ultimately funded by the, by the state. Um, from there, I went on and completed a, public, a PhD in, and a doctoral, a four-year doctoral study, looking at organisational culture in public health bodies, such as for primary care for older people, and how to how to change organisational culture. And I introduced a model of home care from Holland, and we tried to introduce it into the HSC over four years as an experiment to see what facilitated, what factors facilitated change and what factors hindered or inhibited change. Uh, from there, I've done a lot of advocacy work for older people uh, in the last five years. I've been doing a lot of teaching, training, healthcare workers, things like that, designing training programs. But in the last year and a half or so in particular, uh, my mother was very ill. She passed away a few weeks ago, in fact. So I've been doing a lot of caring role and hadn't been, I, I, in terms of my independent advocacy for people, that has continued. But in terms of working in a structured way and earn, earning money for that, my care role, I felt, was more important for my mother at that time. So that, that would be my overall background. OK, thank you, Finber. Um, you've listened uh, to what is happening from the story of Mary and uh, from listening to William. Could you give us some level of understanding as to why we have problems with TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency. What's going wrong? 
Yeah, okay. First of all, just to say that we do need an entity like Tusla. And we do have situations where children need shelter and they need a nurturing environment that is being denied them for circumstances. So, for instance, if we have a situation where we have a child whose mother at the moment is a, a serious a, a drug addict, uh, is involving the child in the trade and distribution of that drug, something like that. In those circumstances, yes, where a child, uh, unfortunately, where a mother may have, is, or father, have psychological uh, problems and there are no other uh, care networks around, and, and for temporary reason, uh, uh, measures, there are circumstances where children, it's best to take children into care. However, we have developed in Ireland an organisational culture within our childcare systems that it has created an adverse aerial relationship between the family and the service providers such as Tusla and other service providers that would be linked in with Tusla. So there's this them and us attitude to a very large degree. And it isn't the case that these are these organizational problems that result in the abuses that we talk about. Some of the abuses are are not considered or, or as abuses. They're, they might be seen as negligence and they might be seen as other things. But if we were to generally say that ne negligence is an abuse in the official definition of, of, of abuse. Um, but much of this is intergenerational. Much of this. So if we were to understand an organization as a set of beliefs, two different types of beliefs, espoused beliefs and values. So what we learn at college and what's in the policy documents about everybody should be happy at all times and we should make every effort for the child, but also to keep the family together, all of these official espoused values and beliefs. And in reality, an organization also have the actual beliefs on the ground, what people have come to believe, what they've learned from two sources, what they've learned from their co-workers when they leave college and they go into work as a social worker for the first time and they start realizing that, hey, the espoused values that I learned in my academic life don't seem to be realized in the actual structure of TUSLA and other, other organizations. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Are people who go to study social work intrinsically bad? And I don't believe they are. I think some of our best young people decide to go to work in social work. But something happens. Something happens in the process from university and college to when they go into the actual workplace. And I think what happens is that they learn from the inter the inter intergeneral nature of beliefs. They learn what's passed on to them by senior social workers. And they also have those learnings reinforced by their own experiences. And what I mean is constraints. We have had generations upon generations of constraints to our health services and our social care services. And those constraints have created a monster that at times a monster that can appear even at times sadistic. And this is a result of many different types of constraints in terms of social services. So uh, an example would be funding constraints. When we look at the UK, we have lovely examples where, for example, people with intellectual, intellectual uh, different abilities, where they have a, they, they get pregnant and they're going to have a child. Over here, automatically, social work teams over here will decide that that child is to be separated from the mother. In the UK, parts of the UK, especially right in Manchester and areas like that, they have trusts who are very forward thinking and progressive. And they take the time out to say, well, is there another way to do this? Is there a way to increase support? Is there a way? to apply our time based on relationships rather than targeted outcomes. But over here, people don't take the time to think about that or to work that out. And it's because of constraints, constraints in funding, constraints in terms of how much staff they have, things like that. And those and, and time on each, each service user. And those constraints result in the them and us attitude. Because what happens is, and this is this is noted, this is uh, there was a guy called Michael Lipsky. I was just for the show reviewing Lipsky. I haven't read him in a few years. And Lipsky uh, wrote a, a book in eighty one. He's an American called uh, Street Level Bureaucrats, and it explains all this. So this is not new. This is be, should at least should be taught in, in the colleges. And he explains that when street level bureaucrats like social workers, prison guards, even school teachers, circuit court judges, when they come across these types of constraints. They're like the bad workman. Instead of blaming themselves in the system because that's not comfortable for them, they start blaming their tools, or in this instance, the service user. 
So an assertive, an assertive service user that's demanding their rights, but they may look like they're standing alone, they suddenly become the enemy. So instead of having an espoused value where we see the family, the mother, etc., as partners in working out a solution, they're actually seen in an adversarial context as though they're the enemy. And this can be the result of generation upon generation of financial constraints, funding constraints, etc., where social workers don't have the time. I heard examples there where uh, the lady, I missed the first part of that, that, that interview, I'm really upset about that, I'm going to have to look back at it later, because my sound went. But that lady was talking about the, basically the lack of background checks in the behaviour of her partner, that he was malicious, that he was doing malicious things, that he had certain histories. Now, it's quite common that they don't check things out. It's quite common that they decide that they've already made a decision who the bad guy is, who the, who, the, who the good guy is in this relationship, and they don't check out who they think the good guy is. I've seen children being handed out without background checks to a bank robber from England, believe it or not. And so I do fully believe what this lady has gone through. Uh, I worked with another man recently who had a particular disability, and it was decided by social workers that he wasn't going to follow this child. And so well, we wrote up a report on it, we highlighted in a chronological order what was happening and how that was in conflict with the espoused values found in policy and in laws. And suddenly the table was completely turned. But as you know yourself, Anna, I think from you've been talking to a lot of people, the table only turns for a short while. And then a new social worker comes on board and it's like being back to square one again. You're back to having to go through the battle and the fight. And this wears down mothers and wears down families. So I think general, in generation after generation of constraints have created this monster that has a particular personality type that sometimes it does well, but it would, it would appear at this stage it does more wrong than good. And one little quote from Lipsky about uh, street-level bureaucrats, which I, I, I think covers a lot of what we were saying as well. He says that in defense of the myth of altruism, street level bureaucracies devote a relatively high proportion of energies to concealing lack of service and generating appearances of responsiveness. So a lot of the time that could be spent figuring out new solutions, being progressive, focusing on the relationship of the mother and all of those environmental issues that have brought us to where we are today. But instead of the focus and the energy being on doing that, it's on hiding the failings in our system. And I'm a believer that bureaucracies should punch upwards, not downwards, should punch upwards towards their paymasters to say, we need more, we need more training, we need more funding, we need more capacity. But instead, they're punching downwards quite often on the service users themselves. And once they hit the first blow down, they are guilty of something quite often. And to hide that, they will create bigger and bigger rigmaroles. And something that could have been sorted out quite easily turns into a mess, particularly if the mother or the parent or the guardian is on their own. Just coming back to what William was saying, because I don't want to miss this, I made a wee note of it. Um, I worked for quite a number of years with a, a, a private company, in fact, um, that developed aftercare services for adole adolescents, mainly from Dublin, but it was in the Drogheda region. And we created a number of independent living apartments that had an office attached to it. And the function of this was that when we knew that these kids would be coming towards leaving care, a year beforehand, we would prep them up to move them into these uh, supported living accommodations. And it was working out to be sometimes cheaper than the residential care that we were capping, that they were being capping. But one of the big issues is, I, I, I'm just pulling this figure out of the air, but something like 65 to 70 percent of young people that leave the care system end up homeless within six months. Many of them end up in prostitution and in abusive relationships. And this is all driven through their lack of preparation for leaving care, but also because they've been used as a pawn for so long that they expect to be moved from from one position to another, that there'll be people there to do it for them. And they're not there anymore. And so, absolutely, young people have been failed in aftercare. They need to be prepared uh, for adult living, and also mothers need to be prepared for uh, for uh, motherhood. But it's not yes, new. Yes. I've, yes, I've been yes. involved in so and read so many papers on the issue of aftercare. And again, we just have to look to the UK for really good examples and some small examples that have occurred here. I know I'm talking too much, Anna. Far away. <laughs> well. Um... 
I, I don't mean to smile there. I'm, and I'm, I'm just, uh, um, just in awe of oh, what definitely. you have just said. Um, there's just so, the, there, there's just so much to unpack in what you have said. I, I think it, it's the most honest appraisal that I've ever heard of um, the social care system here in Ireland. And um, I know Finbar that you are starting your own program next week um, on the Irish inquiry and um, Finbar is or sorry uh, Stephen is now just going to uh, run the trailer that will give us a little insight into uh, what we can expect in your program. Double Down is the name of your new programme, which airs next week. Can you tell us a little bit about it, Finbar? Yeah, and I was talking to Stephen and, you know, other people. And over the last year or two, I've been getting very frustrated that we have uh, the potential for online programmes that can discuss things and that can really go interrogate issues until we come up with, with good solutions. But instead, what seems to be developing online are echo chambers where somebody invites somebody that they agree with on and they all clap each other on the back and get emotional and worked up about things. But nothing insightful really comes from it. And as well as that, quite often the wider public are, are duped. As well as that, we have this issue that if somebody has an opinion on something, they're called a fascist or they're called a loony left or whatever the case might be. And nobody's really getting in depth on these issues. So what I'd like to do is to take issues that sometimes might be determined as a bit controversial or radical and actually talk about them in a respectful but in an intelligent way where we're really trying to tease out, well, if that's your proposition, what will Ireland or the world look like if we were to follow that and elaborate on that further rather than just this sloganeering that's going on at the moment. So uh, we're, we're trying to push out the boundaries as is your show as well, Anna, of course. And I think the Irish Inquiry as a media network has great potential and great possibilities. It's great that Stephen and Danny and so many other people are working in the background in production. Well, it promises to be a really good programme. I believe it airs on Thursday nights at 10 o'clock. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, the first show was uh, interviewing uh, Dr. Kevin Howard, who's a leading writer on the Irish diaspora in, in the UK, but also a major contributor to the development of anti-racism policies in, in Ireland. He lives in Ireland. He's a lecturer in DKIT. Um, I wanted to just talk to him about some of the stuff that you see online violent black gangs running amok in Balbriggan, um, uh, Muslim rape gangs uh, in County Mayo. I want to explore this further because I believe those, that, that kind of sloganeering is very dangerous talk. And I want to figure out what's going on here. And I want to talk to people who are at the front line about it. Uh, and I'll, in, in a respectful way, I am trying to get some people who are prom might promote that kind of stuff, that what I would see is, as racism, uh, the idea of deporting uh, non-Irish people. I'm trying to get okay. some leaders of those political parties, okay. to talk, but they won't talk at the moment. Okay. And that kind of leads us uh, quite nicely into uh, the second half of our programme, which, as always, is anchored by Marion McGowan. And uh, each week, Marion introduces the hot topic of the week, and uh, she initiates a panel discussion. Good evening, Marion. Hello there. Good evening, Anna. Good evening, gentlemen. Finn Barman, I wish you the very best in your new program. I shall tune in at 10 o'clock on Thursday, although it's past my bedtime. <laughs> um, I look forward. I look forward to your new program, Finn Barman. Um, Marion, what have you for us tonight? This evening. I'm going to talk about our health service. I'm going to look at or interrogate, as you would put it, Finbar and William, the what, the why and the where. Now, I, I, I don't want to be repeating what we have been hearing quite a lot over the last number of months about the failures in your, our system. Indeed, we are very aware of the failures in our system and uh, this COVID-19 has brought into sharp focus 
the deficiencies and how our health system um, how, will, is not in a position to deal with um, a pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So let me, let me just give you an overview of where I'm coming from. Where I'm coming from is I, 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 I'm saying that our health service has been intentionally decimated over the last number of years because of a political ideology that subscribes to neoliberalism. Neoliberalism emanating from Reagan and Thatcher and tried out in Chile in the 1970s as a pilot program, basically says, let's run this country on the basis of the country being a business, a business for profit. Um, and looking at what constitutes a business, because this was the introduction of quasi markets, was the first thing that happened in the UK under Thatcher, quasi markets. What do we mean? How do we transpose that? How do we run a country for profit? Well, let me just highlight three areas for you. You know that running a company is about supply and demand. Well, the first thing you've got to do is to manage the narrative about existing services. And by doing that, you are by ways managing the supply chain of be it health or be it housing. So what would it be like if we were in a position to actually manage that supply chain? Well, what we would do is, of course, common sense, you don't have to be an economic, econo <laughs> can't even say it, you don't have to be a genius to know <laughs> that you, uh, you reduce supply to increase demand. But part and partial, part, part, I can't speak this evening, um, part of that is actually to control the narrative. So what you do is that you control the narrative around, in this case, the health service. And the narrative there is to say that, you know, public services are inefficient, they're bureaucratic, they don't uh, represent value for money, and it's a decision-free zone. We want to introduce um, quasi-markets where we contract out uh, services so we can introduce efficiencies. So that's about controlling the narrative around that. And alongside that, what you actually have to do is that the whole purpose of this, by the way, is to reduce the quantity and the quality of the services. And as part of that, what you will do is that you will remove employees' rights and you will erode working conditions. So less money, no rights and uh, minimal resources, as, as has been outlined both in, with both our guests this evening. And thus, um, we have seen the flight of many of our nursing and our midwives and our doctors. They're just getting out of the country because they cannot deal with the lack of resources. They're over 72 hours a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have replaced uh, those positions with people who are on contracts, which in itself means that you don't have an awful lot of rights under your contract of employment. Very good. That means you are actually in control there. Rights diminished, providing, etc. So um, let me just give you an idea and give you a quote. I have a, I think I have a slide there. When I talk about ideology. Let me just quote Leo Varadkar when he was health minister. This is the ideology around what has been happening and it hasn't happened by mistake. This is an intentional policy to reduce public services and what encapsulates that for me is this quote. Giving more beds and resources to hospitals is not so good because it can lead to staff working slower and decrease productivity. So that's buying into the narrative that um, essentially uh, public services are inefficient and they're not producing the goods and they're not a quality service. 
So let me just give you the headlines in terms of numbers. I'm sure we've heard these over the last couple of days. 20 years ago, um, there were 10,000 more hospital ben beds available in this country than there are now. Yeah. There are 2,641 fewer midwives and nurses working in the service than there were in 2008. Haven't got any uh, well, 2015. Um, we all remember the nurses and midwives strike that happened recently. Nothing has um, moved forward since that strike. Um, back in 2001, when Adam was a boy, as some people would say, the primary care centres were promised. And in that, they identified that we needed at least 600 primary care centres throughout the country. Well, that was in 2001. To date, we only have, we only have um, less than 100. So, at the same time, what we are looking at here, I'm speaking about an ideology. What we are looking at here is decimating the supply and access to public health, whilst at the same time, and during this period, in the 1980s, no private clinics or hospitals really existed. So during that same period, over 2,000 bed spaces uh, were put online or at the disposal of the rest of us in this country. And um, private healthcare has been promoted by tax breaks such uh, to, to investors. For example, um, if you invest around 100,000, in capital costs, there's a tax break of 40,000. And um, also the private sector have been supported by um, subsidized private health insurance. So all of this amounts to essentially running down a service, subsidizing private intervention, managing a narrative that says, well, actually public services are inefficient and we want to provide value for money and they're bureaucratic. bureaucratic and actually skewing, skewing um, the resources, which has ended up with us having a situation now where access to healthcare is based on your ability to pay rather than on your need, be it through injury or illness. In fact, the narrative is so strong that we actually believe that it's okay and we look for trolley counts rather than access to health care. We think that, well, you know, how has this happened? Well, we are told that there's an increase in population, so therefore our existing certain no. It's none of this is intentional. This is about supply demand. Okay. And this is about encouraging us to buy private insurance and running down the competition. Now, I think you will find echoes of that, gentlemen, in the sectors you are working in. For example, William, you're working in the housing and social sector, housing, social housing and homelessness sector. Housing and homelessness has now become a huge issue and people are wondering why people are homeless. What you, my question is, is it time really to take the profit out of our healthcare system the profit is also hugely, hugely obvious in our housing system. And as you were saying, Finton, in our care system as well. Over to you, gentlemen. What do you think, William? Thoughts on what has been said this evening and, and what I've just put to you? Um, I, I, I think you're right. Um, when I first started in inner city having homes and uh, started setting up the BAB system, um, it was said to me, you're, you're going up against an industry um, and it's very, very hard to change an industry when there's a lot of people making a lot of profit from it um, and that the changes will be slight and they will be from within. Um, and we get, we get a lot of people coming in and saying to us that uh, they're three months waiting for, for to see um, a, a mental health service. They're, they are registered with that mental health service, but 
it could be three to six months. And if you miss the appointment, you go you go through. And the answer, you know, invariably is, you know, you, you can get an appointment for a private psychiatrist um, within a week or maybe in, maybe within a few days. Um, but if you are dependent on on the on the on the system, uh, then you know you you may not come in. And, and everywhere you go, you see it. An empty chair is is, is a missed appointment, and, and that and it, it quantifies it down. The industry that the industry that I am in um, for housing and and stuff like that, it's it's plain, it's it's obvious to see um, that. People are profiting from it. Uh, just, just look at COVID nineteen. The you know the, the the money that was going to hotels and the money that was going to emergency accommodation. You know all of these things. Um, the, 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 it was all going into the private sector. Um, and did they deliver? It, it's 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 plain to see that a lot of the time they didn't deliver, and we didn't get value for money at the time. And this is this is really part of the of of the of the narrative that says public is bad because you know as well as I do that public housing was always seen as a residual of council housing as something you are it's stigmatized and what we should be asking is around actually why don't we have a choice in secure affordable tenures that have nothing to do with profit and this is this very much and I'll, I'll come on to you Finn Maria because you mentioned the UK this very much replicates what was happening in the UK in the 90s uh, early 90s late 90s where bed and breakfasts were being used for emergency accommodation and they were hugely inefficient and huge profits were being made um, and it's this sticky plaster stuff that was going on. Finbar, in terms of, of, of what we're talking about here, is it time for us to take the profit out of the, out of the support and care and advocacy industry? To maybe, first of all, be more nuanced than what we mean by uh, the private aspect of us and the profit. Okay. I think that if somebody has a private shop in a hospital, that's fine. If you have an electrical contract with a local electrician firm for needs of the hospital, even that's fine. When it comes to the actual access and delivery of the specific services themselves, the mental health services, the medical services, etc., that clearly needs for numerous reasons to be brought in as a public option that everybody has. Now, the argument against public health services and you hear extreme arguments from the United States and from other parts of the world and they'll say this is communism this is an attack on our freedom to choose who we want to provide our health care but uh, there is a solution around that and that is to build to give everybody a public option remember our health care system was designed to be hated by the taxpayer from day one it was designed in a way that you pay a tax, but you still have to take out private care. So you, there's a residual resentment that, that has been in the system for decades upon decades, over half a century at least. So that is inbuilt in there. And so as you say, both of you guys agree, there is this public consciousness that the public health care system in Ireland is in some way defective. So we need to get over that. But first of all, we need to change the funding model itself. Um, I can't remember, Ivan... Brown, I think her name was, she wrote a number of books on the health service. I, I didn't agree with her first book because it promoted privatisation, but her second book, but the, but the first book was just looking at the, the, the why you can't it change. And she was making the point that um, when we have this democratic process where every four years slash five years, we change government and their health priorities change, their friends change. Some of them are, will be focusing on companies that can come in and they, maybe they got support in some way from pri private healthcare companies and so their policy will be there. In four years' time, we've got an, another government in and their focus is slightly elsewhere. And all the time, it's about funding. All the time, that's about the modular changes about funding they want to make. And so they're not talking about the real issues about having a progressive and, and cutting edge health service. And so the conversation is always elsewhere. So my suggestion is that we, we actually tie this down once and for all. Are we going to have a public option for everybody? And if so, 
put it into the Constitution, put the argument about that to bed, and let's focus on the best health, best health service that we can get. I think, I think you make some very valid points there. And what I, I, I would throw out there for consideration and interrogate is how we immediately, uh, through narratives, through various other means, we connect public with inefficiency and not representing value for mo money. I would challenge that. Hmm. Equally, I would suggest that rather than who's friends, etc., this has actually been influenced by a disposition, an ideology. And even to the basics where you're saying that actually, you know, well, why should you? Why should you have access to health if you can't pay? Why should you have access to housing if you don't pay? I was going to call um, the, the policy, the health and housing policy over the last number of years in Ireland as, as rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic because you are working within a framework. Yeah. An ideology that isn't changing, that hasn't changed. Just, just to uh, re respond to that, I, uh, if it's a case, now let's, let's be honest, a lot of people make their decisions based on their self-interest. And if they think private care is going to be better, and I don't blame them for going for it in, in a way, okay? However, I, let's, let's, I would, I would, I would, to be, to be honest, but let me, let me just finish what I want to say for a wee second, because we're not going to change those people overnight. However, if we decide to talk to them in a slightly different way and say, but it is in your interest, because it's been proven time and time again that when we collectivise our funding to fund the health, health service, the quality of the health service for everybody improves. So even if it is self-interest, even in that case, the argument must be in favour of the public option for health care. Absolutely, Finbar, and I was just I was I was just responding when you said, you know, given the circumstances and given how our public health has been run down, you know, if you could afford it, why on earth wouldn't you take out uh, insurance? And my question is, why should I? Where are we going with this? Um, can I? Brilliant. Can I come in for a second? Um, I've had this conversation actually with people that have been put into the bed and breakfast and the and the hostels and the hotels. And some of them have come back to me um, and said, we would not mind paying a little bit towards our accommodation if our accommodation was suitable and fit for purpose. Because what it would do is it would get us ready for when we went on to our next, to, uh, on to our, if, if we uh, took a hat property or a council property, we would have to pay rent. But because of we're in the system where we are, and, and because it's going to private operators, and some of them are, some of them are doing a good job, some of them aren't. But some of them, but, but what is that people given the options? They're just being told you can go there, and. What we find is that people say to us, we would be prepared to pay a little because it would help us then. It would, would be gearing towards us. But they're not getting the option. And I think Finbar is right. And um, I hope to ask you a question before we before we leave on, 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 on the other issue. But um, they're not getting the options. And I think you're right on that. I think that um, there needs to be an option. And there needs to be a good option, a good public health option. And if you decide then to go forward or to top it up and whatever, but there needs to be a good public option. And I think that we need to start um, looking at how we, we, we educate and how we are treating people at the moment. Because I believe that at the moment we are creating a whole cohort, a whole group of people that are just being given. And But it's, it's like your you know your your experience homes or whatever so here's your room and here's your food and there's you're not looking at any way of giving them value for that or even value for themselves and i think that's wrong as a society that we're allowing that to happen yeah agency you're talking about agency of people who use those services absolutely absolutely couldn't disagree with that i'm Could conscious I? that we're running a little bit over time 
and oh. Anna's going to come in and wave a big stick at me in no. a completely non-violent way. Yes, and I'm, I'm very conscious of that, Anna. So um, I'm, I'm sure we can continue this longer, but of course I'm, I'm conscious of time. You've got a very excellent uh, panel. Uh, we have an excellent panel with us this evening. I think um, we wanted to ask a question. I wouldn't like to lose that opportunity. To... Yes, I agree. Um, I, I, I just pointing back when you were saying about um, when, when we finished up on, on the um, on the on the on the Tusa agency. The one thing I, I agreed with everything you said. Sometimes children need to go into care, and it, it's kind of over the whole kind of system as well. But the one thing I would like to ask you is this, and I'd really like to get your opinion on it. If the social workers are so um, are, are so inundated with work, and they're finding it hard. Why is it so hard as an advocate when you're doing the work for them to get an answer? Because you're, you have the time to sit and listen to the person and you're breaking it down and you're showing them where the failings are and you're not doing it for, you're not doing it for your own good. You're actually there, like I volunteer. And I want to know why is it so hard for them to actually understand that I'm actually trying to make their job easier. And I'm also trying to advocate for the mother. So can you can you answer me that? That why is it so hard as an advocate to actually get an answer? Yeah, Even I, when I, you're... I, I think re, uh, perceptions of risk come into it. Who the who are you? What if he is wrong? What if he? So they don't have the capacity themselves, but they're not. So you'll see in all the policy documents about uh, team working with outside agencies as well as families, etc. Uh, but in reality, that as you know, that doesn't play out on the ground because you're not them. And it's like the, we come across life people who can cope with anything, but won't let anybody else do the job. You ever meet people like that? They're just, a, and you have that. I think some of it is about risk. Some of it is about self-perception as individuals in an organization. So if I'm a social worker, right, and I have a boss, and it looks like a lot of an outside agency is now doing my work. I call it co-working. They call it something else. You're not pulling your weight. Or something like that. So I think there's, there's a lot of different th things come come into it. I wouldn't have it. A, you'd have to do a study on that in itself <laughs> to really come up with the answer to that. But I, I think there can be a lot of different. All all of this together can be described in one word, or maybe two words: pathological behaviours. So these are organisations can be pathological, just like individuals. So to protect themselves, to defend themselves, to ensure that nobody gets in in their space, nobody gets to see what goes on on their in their circles, which outside agencies might get to see. They might have a closer view and realise about the ineptitudes in here, and so keep them at a distance. You know, and these are so when I talk about risk, it's not just risk to family; it's risk to their own image and their own public image and, and things like that. But uh, all of it, in my mind can be brought down to the phrase pathological behavior. When organizations become, the raison d'etre becomes themselves and their own protection and covering their backs and covering their, focusing on privatization. So I worked with a company that was a private company. It, was a, it had a number of bungalows and residential units for adolescents and care. And we did our best, but the truth was this, they were our paymasters, the Tusla. And I lost the job of, of, of one company for 10 years. I worked with this particular company. And because there was a lot of psychological abuse uh, uh, with regard to the girl who was pregnant, and they decided they were going to take her child before the baby was even born. And they actually they manufactured lies, complete lies in documents. And I noticed that my co-workers were starting to accept these lies, even though they were obvious and blatant lies, that we were there to see that these things didn't happen. Uh, so I stood up against that, wrote out reports, etc. And that child, your baby was taken, but but you got the baby back. But that had such a an impact on me that I never worked in that field again. The experience I had, and uh, the, the the intimidation and the bullying that I went through. However, I did carry the learnings with me into everything that I that I do. Sorry, William, I diverted a bit there. Do you think that's the um, Do you think that the silo effect um, of people of of all the agencies working in their own silo? will uh, at some stage be broken down and that they will actually start to have some joined up thinking where you can actually have something come together and you can actually advocate properly. That if you, if you can prove yourself to be that you're limiting the risk and you're actually trying to help 
um, that there will eventually become some joined up thinking. Um, I think two things will have to happen. Beyond the individual organisations, there will have to be some kind of an organisational cultural assessment. What the hell is going on here? What do you people really believe? And we need and do. And we need to, and this is the problem, they won't do, they talk about changing organisational culture, but they won't do it because the first part of doing that is taking your clothes off and getting naked. The first part of changing your organisation is accepting what you are going and seeking and looking at for what you really are and accepting that. And they seem to be quite shy in this regards. So they'll always come out with that phrase, oh, going to culture change, things like that. But the first part is revealing yourself for what you are. And they're not willing to do that in case jobs are lost. They're not willing to do that in case systems fall. But I, there was a guy called Edgar Sheen. And he said, one of the most important things in an organization is the myths and the legends. That fella, did you hear about the fella a few years ago got fired because he abused this client? Did you hear about the one that got fired? Those things there. So when you talk about accountability, that's what accountability it is. Accountability is not just that somebody is secretly paid off and has moved to another department. Accountability is when there's a public issue made about a public matter like that and that it's remembered for years within the organization and it teaches lessons to all the young people coming in. So accountability isn't a, a revenge thing. It has a particular function in keeping an organisation on the straight and narrow. And you mentioned it at the beginning, William. I'm sure I'll, I'll finish off with going back to that. Okay. Um, I'd like to give the final word to Marion. That's hugely interesting and a whole conversation in itself, gentlemen, there. But even as a very practical way of... Um, um, dealing with the um, role that the, 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 the private or the, or the NGO sector pay, I think there really has to be a separation between the funder and the regulator. Yeah? TUSLA cannot be the regulator as well as there needs to be a separation there as a first step towards enabling um, organisations who depend on their funding to be able to advocate without fear of losing their funding. That's my very practical suggestion on that. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Oh my goodness, um, a very, very interesting discussion there. I want to thank most sincerely uh, my guest this evening. First of all, I would like to thank Mary um, the mother who spoke to me earlier. Uh, I'd like to thank William and uh, Dr. Finbar and uh, thank Marion. And most of all, I would like to thank you who have been watching. Um, I hope you um, have learned as much as I have from this evening's programme. Um, we are depending on you to share um, this video. Um, and until um, next week um, at, um, eight, at uh, eight o'clock, um, I hope that you have a, one, a wonderful um, week. Um, many, many thanks to Stephen Kerr from the, um, the Irish Inquiry. And as I said at the beginning of the programme, if you would like to volunteer your uh, services by way of uh, uh, videography or editing, um, you can go to the Irish Inquiry website and there is a tab there, a drop down tab, help us and you can enter the details there. So until next Wednesday evening at eight o'clock, Barat de Arif Galair.